Despite my best efforts at that intro, the Toyota Prius isn't the coolest car on the block. If you're ordering a Lyft or an Uber, chances are that one of these will turn up to whisk you away. And with the world gravitating towards electric vehicles, the hybrid Prius seems like just another Toyota misstep, like their attempt to sell us cars using hydrogen fuel cells. But the Prius's economical hybrid powertrain has likely saved more than 5 billion gallons of petrol from being burned since it was introduced. Just why did Toyota start looking into hybrids? And are hybrids really a dead-end technology? This is the Toyota Prius story. The Prius wasn't the first hybrid, far from it. Ferdinand Porsche created the Lona Porsche mixed hybrid at the end of the 19th century. Each wheel had an electric motor powered by batteries, and those batteries were charged by a generator that ran on petrol. But with petrol being cheap and the nascent state of battery technology, hybrid cars didn't make a lot of sense until the advent of better batteries and higher petrol prices. In 1993, the US government started an initiative to encourage car makers to make mainstream, full-size cars dramatically more fuel efficient. Toyota applied to join this initiative, but it quickly became clear that this had been set up as an American boys-only club for Ford, GM and Chrysler, and funding would only be given to them. The big three car makers made some progress, and the gains spooked Toyota. They'd spent decades fighting for market share in the world's biggest auto market, and didn't want to see one or all of Detroit's finest create a car that would beat Toyota's own Camry on fuel economy. The American high-miling prototypes were using diesel engines with an electric motor and batteries to get up to 80 miles per gallon, including regenerative braking to recharge the batteries. But in truth, Toyota already had a program looking into a low emission vehicle, the Earth Charter, that was a reaction to the late 1980s concern over global warming. The Earth Charter was repurposed to take on Detroit's new cars that were looking into hybrid technology. Toyota's engineers used two key documents to help them, a 1942 book on torque converters by American Peter Heldt, and a 1969 technical paper from TRW, who'd invented a novel hybrid system after being given US government money to look into cleaner engines in the 1960s. Around that time, GM had demonstrated various EV concepts, including a hybrid, and I talk a little bit about it in my video about 1960s and 70s EVs. So, Japanese Toyota benefited from American know-how from the 1940s and 60s, in some cases paid for by the US taxpayer, but that's not to denigrate Toyota's engineers. They were smart enough to see improving battery technology made this technology usable. And there's years of hard work to turn a prototype, like that demonstrated by TRW, into something that can go into mass production and work day in, day out, from Alaska to the Sahara. The solution they landed on threw out the regular gearbox, and instead used two motor generators. They're called motor generators because they work both as motors to power the drive shaft to make the car move, but also as generators to slow the car and store the energy into batteries. The engine's also attached to the drive shaft, but the hybrid system allows it to run at an ideal rev range that optimizes fuel economy, or not at all if the car stopped or moving slowly. The ability to start or stop the engine easily had been pioneered by Toyota with the Crown in 1974, so they were already familiar with implementing it. This ingenious system of two motor generators and a planetary gear system that acted as a clutch of sorts produced a more efficient powertrain. If you want to learn more about how Toyota's hybrid system works, there's links to a couple of excellent videos that you can check out in the description. Charging a cell phone or a laptop uses a steady stream of electrons from a charger to slowly charge the battery. On a vehicle, recharging comes more erratically and violently with sudden braking. Batteries don't like this, so Toyota chose to store energy in capacitors that are more forgiving of this type of charging, but can't store much energy. It was thought that this was ideal for driving, but over time it was found that nickel-metal hydride batteries would work better. 
rather than charging and discharging them between zero and 100%. To keep the batteries healthy for years, they were only charged between 40 and 60%, even though 40% appeared to the driver as empty and 60% as full. That would give Toyota the confidence to put a 10 year, 150,000 mile warranty on the battery pack. So while Ford, GM and Chrysler were still planning their fuel busting full size cars, Toyota revealed the Prius concept in 1995. The name Prius was Latin for prior or before. The Prius would be the car that would come before a whole new generation of highly fuel efficient cars that use the hybrid drivetrain. Inside was an interior suitable for a prototype, loud colours, LCD panels and big Teletubby buttons. But this was all smoke and mirrors. When they showed off the Prius concept, they had yet to even fire up the car's powertrain. I'm sure it was natural for other automakers to think that this was just another show car that would become a footnote in history. But just two years later in 1997, Toyota revealed the finished Prius to the world. The California style body had barely changed. To get a low drag of just 0.29, designers had raised the seating position slightly, making it easier to get in and out of the car. And this would be adopted by other mainstream cars in the future. Inside, those oversized controls had been tamed, but still featured an expensive LCD screen front and center showing the main event, the status of the Prius's hybrid system. By showing how energy was being used, it was hoped it could encourage careful driving habits to increase real world fuel economy. While the drivetrain was revolutionary, the gear shifter still featured the familiar park, reverse, neutral and drive, plus a new brake option. This was useful on steep hills, using the motor generator to provide extra slowing power, like a low gear on an automatic gearbox. The Prius was only sold in Japan, but customers there loved it. Competitors soon started importing them to find out just what Toyota was up to. The motoring press warmed to it, and the Prius went on to win many awards. It sold at a reasonable price, but rivals estimated it cost Toyota twice as much to produce it. But if Toyota was making a loss, they were undaunted and went all in on producing hybrids. They could see costs coming down as economies of scale kicked in, and they predicted by 2005, hybrids would account for a third of all cars produced. Toyota didn't have the hybrid market all to itself for long though. Honda had been working on a simpler hybrid vehicle, which they released as the Insight in 1999. Where the Prius could get to combine 58 miles per imperial gallon, the Insight could get 64 from its tiny three cylinder one litre engine. The Insight's engine was so small and the car was so light that YouTube channel Robot Cantina used a lawnmower engine in one with very cool results. Check it out in the link in the description. But Honda's Insight was less practical, with just two seats and a hypermiling shape. Honda was quick to export their new car, beating Toyota to the punch. But like the fable of the tortoise and the hare, the first off the line doesn't always win the race. Sales of the two-seater Insight never reached the levels of the five-seater Prius. Honda lost money on each one sold and ended production in 2006, replacing it with a direct Prius competitor in 2010. Although sales of the initial model had been modest, this all seemed to be according to Toyota's plan, who were still working to make their hybrid system bulletproof. As testing got underway outside of Japan, it became clear that the Prius wasn't happy in hot climates and at high altitudes. Toyota's temporary fix was to tell the driver to pull over when the Prius was having problems, but it's clear they needed to produce a better solution. By 2000, a few improvements had been introduced and the power of the engine and the hybrid system had been increased. This was mainly to satisfy the longer distances and higher speeds demanded in the American market, but the Prius was soon exported all over the world. Customers found that rather than being a confusing car with hypermiling compromises, the Prius drove and operated just like any other regular car. Naturally, the car was a draw to customers who wanted to lower their impact on the environment. And Toyota was keen to appeal to this market with commitments to recycle as much of the car at the end of its useful life. 
To allay concerns of reliability or depreciation, competitive leasing options were also available. By the time the first generation ended production, over 120,000 had been produced. The Prius's saloon shape combined with rear-mounted batteries resulted in limited boot space. Engineers had been producing cars with a cam-tailed teardrop shape since the 1970s, delivering a lower drag profile. Toyota knew that they could use this shape to further lower drag while giving the car more storage space, and this would become the signature Prius shape with the new 2003 second generation. The 15cm longer wheelbase not only helped with boot space, but was a boon for rear passengers. The drag coefficient from this 5-seater was just 0.26, just a little more than the 2-seater Honda Insight. Both battery capacity and weight shrank, partly through an expanded 40-80% to charging range. The engine and the motor power increased, which understandably increased acceleration, but it also increased fuel economy. The second generation hybrid system, now branded as the Hybrid Synergy Drive, better captured lost energy whilst braking. Toyota realised that drawing power from the reserve batteries made more sense than the engine, so the air conditioner now ran off electricity, as did the power assisted steering. This simplified the powertrain, so reducing costs. As was fitting for such an advanced car, it would get some of the latest technology features such as push button start and stop and parking assist. The new Prius could be powered purely by batteries for the first time, but only short distances, really short distances, just over a mile. Toyota ramped up production for the expected demand, and that demand came, with sales leaping almost fourfold in 2004, and sales would continue a steep rise. As Toyota started to prove that hybrids weren't a loss leader, but actually were a real competitive advantage, competitors rushed to catch up. GM announced a partnership with Daimler Chrysler to produce a hybrid powertrain in 2004. Ford was quicker off the mark, introducing a hybrid Ford Escape in 2005, and Hyundai started offering hybrids in 2008. Nissan started offering a hybrid in the Ultima in 2007, but embarrassingly for them, they had to go cap in hand to their big rivals Toyota to use theirs. As the competition scrambled to catch up, Toyota was already expanding its hybrid lineup to more than just one car. The Alped became a hybrid in 2003, and the Highlander and Lexus RX followed two years later. By 2011, 14 different Toyota and Lexus models had a hybrid option, all using essentially the same well-thought-out hybrid design Toyota had first designed 15 years before. If there's an award for the most inappropriate tie-in, it should probably be given to the Prius GT concept. The fuel-sipping car was stripped of all essential gear, tuned, given beefier 16-inch wheels, and a roll cage and painted in the colours of the Toyota Formula 1 team. Or given the Formula 1 team's lacklustre performance, maybe it was supposed to be their new race car. Regardless, this fevered creation was, at least according to Toyota, only ever meant to be a concept. The Prius got a small update in 2005, with a slightly revised front end, higher resolution LCD screen, option of a backup camera, and side curtain airbags. But the Prius stayed mainly the same. Quite right too, as sales were booming. The second generation sold about 10 times more than the first generation over roughly the same time period. That meant Toyota had to get the third generation Prius right. Outside, it looked almost the same as the previous generation, but Toyota again managed to reduce drag. It went on a diet with various parts now made of aluminium, but with more modern conveniences like a heads-up display and radar cruise control, the new car actually weighed more. To continue to sell to drivers concerned about the environment, Toyota used greener bioplastics derived from wood and grass. But although it looked very similar to the previous car, the chassis was all new and was shared between many other vehicles, including the latest generation Corolla, which would get its own hybrid version by 2013. A novel new feature was a solar-powered roof that powered a fan to reduce heat buildup when the car was parked, and the driver could use it to power the air conditioning before they got into the car. 
It was originally intended to charge the battery as well, but engineers found doing so caused interference with the radio. Under the hood, the hybrid system was overhauled yet again, with 90% of the components redesigned. The 1.5 litre engine was expanded to 1.8 litres, producing more power, yet despite this larger engine, the Prius went even further on a full tank. The larger engine increased torque, reducing engine revs which produced better fuel economy at highway speeds. With an electric water pump, the engine got rid of the final accessory belt, again further simplifying the car. LED lighting further reduced electric draw, new eco and power modes allowed the driver to choose between fuel economy and performance, although we're talking about the Prius here, so don't get your hopes up about that power mode. I'm sure Toyota worked some electronics magic to produce different driving profiles with these different modes, but to be honest I've had a hard time spotting the difference between driving modes on cars I've driven. I sometimes wonder if pushing the eco button just turns a little green LED light on to make you feel better. When more cars began running purely on electric power, there was a concern that these near silent cars could hit pedestrians who didn't hear the car coming. This led Toyota to producing an add-on which played a sound when the car was driving slowly, described by some as sounding like a deranged spaceship. Despite the UK finding no correlation between pedestrian accidents and EV driving, China, the EU and the US have implemented rules mandating all vehicles driving slowly on electric power to emit at least some noise. With today's quiet internal combustion engines and additional soundproofing, the loudest sound, at least to my ears, seems to come from the wheels, which makes both types of vehicles about as loud as each other. The Prius got its mid-cycle refresh in 2011, and it was joined by the Prius C, or Aqua. The same length as the original Prius, but built off the chassis from the Toyota Yaris, the C stood for City, and designed for people who wanted a slightly smaller hybrid. It proved to be particularly popular in its home market of Japan, but less so around the world, where buying a more fuel-efficient regular Prius made more sense. The Prius Plus, V or Alpha, depending on where you live, offered a slightly larger MPV shape based on the same Prius platform and powertrain. Rear cargo space was 50% larger, and the car introduced the world to Toyota's new Intune multimedia navigation and telematics system, but the drag coefficient and fuel economy took a hit over the regular car. Toyota had been experimenting with a plug-in hybrid Prius since 2006 by replacing the nickel metal hydride battery pack with a larger, more powerful lithium ion pack and allowing it to be recharged from the grid. It would take six years until they had a version that was ready for the public, the Prius plug-in hybrid launched in 2012. It would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Chevrolet's new Volt, released in Europe as the Ampera but where the Volt could go around 40 miles before it needed to use the internal combustion engine, good enough for a trip to work or to the shops, the range of the Prius plug-in hybrid wasn't anything to write home about. Instead of being able to get around a mile on EV power with a regular Prius, you could now go 14 miles. Was that really worth even plugging the car in? Especially as the car cost thousands more to buy? The public seemed to agree, and the plug-in Prius sales never seemed to have really taken off. The fourth generation Prius in 2015 got Toyota's new styling treatment that made it look like a low polygon car from the 80s arcade game Hard Driving. It was a fussy shape, but there was more room inside, and Toyota made it slippery with an even lower drag coefficient. Inside, the displays retain the same layout as the original Prius, with a central screen and an instrument cluster centrally mounted above it. The switches for the heated seats were cleverly hidden from view and reach, so customers wouldn't waste valuable electricity on something as frivolous as getting warm. Customers could own the car for years and still never know that they paid for this feature. Toyota somehow managed to boost the fuel economy again. It was now 26% more fuel efficient than the original car. Emissions were so low that certain models were exempt from London's congestion charge. Performance wasn't its strong suit, but it could still accelerate to 60 in 10.5 seconds. But old rival Honda had produced the new Insight that had very similar figures and cost less. 
the competition had finally caught up. Toyota's head start and expansion of its hybrid technology to other models meant that by 2016 they'd sold over 10 million hybrids, over 28 different models. It continued to experiment with a 2019 prototype plastered with solar panels. Toyota claimed it could get 27 miles on electricity if left out in the sun all day. So is this hybrid business really worth it? In the 80s and 90s customers flocked to diesels because although they were more expensive to buy, over the life of the car they saved you money. But is this true with hybrids? I'm based in the USA where fuel is cheap, so let's compare the cost to buy an internal combustion engine car and a hybrid, put fuel in both of them to travel 36,000 miles over three years, and then sell them. I haven't included maintenance costs and I've assumed the price of petrol to be $3. If I bought a Toyota Camry, I'd have saved $1,200 by buying the hybrid version. I'd also save money with the Avalon and the RAV4, but for the larger Highlander and for Hondas and Hyundais, it's quite the opposite. You'd actually pay more for buying a hybrid. Europe, of course, is a very different matter. If I offered you petrol for $3 a gallon, you'd bite my hand off. Right now, petrol is going for more than double that at around £5.50 a British gallon. I had a harder time trying to find petrol and hybrid comparisons. The best I could find was comparing the Honda CRV over two years, but even if you sell it after just two years, you'd be £2,300 better off if you plumped for the hybrid. The high price for fuel, the flight away from fuel efficient diesels, and cheaper hybrid drivetrains mean that if you want to buy a Toyota Yaris, Corolla, CHR, RAV4, Camry, or a Highlander, you can only get a hybrid drivetrain as there isn't enough demand for less fuel efficient standard drivetrains. Purely petrol models are reserved for inexpensive tiny cars like the Ago or full blooded monsters like the Supra. Nissan, who's been resisting hybrids for years, announced a major investment strategy into next generation hybrids in 2021. Even Ford, who took the US government's money in the 1990s to make fuel efficient cars, has copied Toyota, and five of its eight mainstream vehicles all come as a hybrid. In the third quarter of 2020, over 10% of all cars sold in Europe used a hybrid powertrain. Of course, with so many Toyotas and Lexi using hybrid engines, where does that leave the Prius? Has it fulfilled its purpose of to come before? Well, in a sense it has. With the Corolla and Prius sharing the same chassis and drivetrain, there's very little difference between the two. But the Prius has a place in people's minds as a car that puts fuel economy first, and Toyota clearly feels there's still a place for the brand. The thing that sparked my interest to do this video was a news article that Toyota was finally getting on the EV bandwagon. Toyota's been spending 25 years on hybrids and fuel cells that now seem like a dead end. Surely they've seen the error of their ways now that Tesla seems to be so far ahead on next generation electric powertrains and now they're scrambling to catch up. Well, I'm not so sure. In the late 1990s, Toyota made a bet that they could make hybrids so cheap that it would be madness not to choose one. That day, in countries that have expensive fuel at least, seems to have arrived. Yes, they need to catch up with EV technology, but they've got a head start with their in-depth knowledge of motor generators and small hybrid battery packs, or larger plug-in hybrids. And despite what some governments are promising, the world isn't going to go to just EVs anytime soon. Many car owners keep their cars at the side of the road, and the infrastructure to charge all these cars overnight isn't going to happen overnight. And no one has yet produced a battery pack that can be charged as fast as it takes to fill up a petrol car. Nissan seems to agree that hybrids are a good stepping stone to reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. Hybrids, at least today, seem like they were the right bet. The Prius wasn't the first har hybrid to get up to 80 miles per gallon, including regenerative. That's a difficult word. Tea, need tea. Batteries don't like this, so Toyota chose to store energy in. The name Prius was Latin for prior or before. 
the Prius would be the car that would become that would give Toyota the confidence to put a 10 year 150,000 mile warranty on the battery pack that just sounds wrong that would give Toyota the confidence to put a 10 year 150,000 mile warranty on the battery pack that's two takes it still sounds bad so while Ford, GM and Chrysler were still planning their fuel-busting full-size cars, Toyota revealed, why can't I say Toyota? This is a problem, if I can't say Toyota on a video about the Prius, I've got problems. You know, if I actually read the words on the script, it would be easier. I missed out a word there. The engine and motor power increased, which understand... Oh la la la! running out of tea. The same length as the original Prius, but built off the Toyota Yaris chassis. Yaris chassis. That is hard to say. 